We're Derek and Romaine, and you know, we've been working on expanding our offerings to all of all, all of you listeners out there. And as part of that, Derek and I came up with the idea to do a little weekend show on occasion. We're going to test some stuff out, right, Derek? Is that yes, how you would call it? Yes, we're going to see how it's going to go. And we thought we would uh, get some fan favorite guests from the show. Well, now that was a good idea. Who yeah. I, whose idea was that? Well, I think it was us. I, was, I think it was our own idea. Was it your idea? I, think, idea I actually it? think it was your idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, look, I don't want to take all the credit around here. Right. But we uh, thought we would kick things off with Adam Sank, who has uh, been a guest and guest host on our show for years and years and years. Uh, and he's a delightful comedian and personality. And uh, he has brought a lot to the show over the years. Yeah. So Derek and Romaine presents... Adam Sank. But no, I was thinking about the real Elmo, you guys, because a few years back, I don't know if you remember this, the voice of Elmo on Sesame Street, uh, the guy behind the voice was accused by several guys of having molested them when they were underage. And there's absolutely nothing funny about that, except for this. (laughs) Allegedly, they met him on these gay phone sex lines. Now... Many of you in here are old enough to remember before there was Grindr and Scruff and AOL chat rooms and Manhunt, there, there were these, uh, these phone sex lines where it was like, I think it was like three ninety nine a minute. I don't know, I only called them like a thousand times. And um, I don't really remember how they worked. I remember that you would call and you would listen to like recordings that other guys had left. And then if you liked what you heard, you could like hit a code and be connected to them. Is that how it worked? It was something exactly like that. And... Um, <laughs> And this is allegedly how Elmo uh, stalked his prey. So I'm, I'm imagining this. I imagine it was something like, uh, hey, guys, uh, Anthony, 6'2", uh, brown hair, brown eyes, big cut cock. Just looking for some action. Hit me up if you're interested. Hi, guys. This is Bruce. 5'6", um, blonde hair, blue eyes, bi-curious. Just looking for some fun, looking to play, you know, and just, just seeing who's out there. Okay. Hi, everyone! <laughs> Elmo's horny! <laughs> Elmo wants to party and play! <laughs> Elmo can host or travel! a fisting bottom. (laughs) He is. All of those Muppets are fisting bottoms. That's how they stay upright. Greetings, Derek and Romaine listeners. It is I, the ghost of novelist, humanitarian, poetess, and most importantly, friend of Oprah, Dr. Maya Angelou. As you know, I rarely make earthly appearances, but there is something today happening that is so monumental, so much greater than the Mastodon, that I felt the need to come down to earth and announce it. It is not the impeachment of Donald Trump. That doesn't happen for another six months. P.S. It's happening. I see all. No, it is the premier radio broadcast of alleged comedian Adam Sank. And so please, welcome to the airwaves now, that loudmouthed homo himself, Mr. Adam Sank. Oh my God, thank you, Dr. Maya Angelou. Yes, it is I, Adam Sank, coming to you live from the Derek and Romaine studios here in Times Square. I am so friggin' excited. It only took... How many years have I been doing Derek and Romaine show? Probably about 15 years. I've lost count. Um, But finally, they let me uh, have the microphone all to myself. Uh, Derek and Romaine are not in the studio today. However, they clearly were terrified to leave me on my own. So we have a full house. We have Katie Kate Kate uh, at the board and producing the show. We have ADD Jeff, uh, who for some reason is naked. I I don't understand why that happened. I'm not naked. well, they don't have to know that, Jeff. It's radio. They all see me on the camera. Oh, fuck you. See, you're already bombing my show. Don't speak, Jeff. Jeff is working the phones and killing my jokes. And uh, we also have a, a, a lovely intern uh, named Orlando. 
who the listeners are probably familiar with by now. Um, and we have you guys. We have your phone calls. Please call me at 844-TALK-DNR. That's 844-825-5367. Um, we are going to be talking about a lot of things today. Also, uh, my special guest, Gerald McCulloch, fabulous, hot, out, gay director and actor. Ger- Gerald McCulloch, you might know him from C- CSI, from Bear City, from the movie Daddy. He has a brand new documentary about male strippers that actually just started streaming today. I have seen it. It is full frontal. It is awesome. We will talk to him about what it was like making that documentary, uh, which I have a feeling was a labor of love for him. And we also have a mystery guest at the end of today's broadcast. A mystery guest will join us. And uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but it's very exciting. And uh, and those so I, I'll give a clue. This is how it's going to work. I'll give a clue later in the show as to the identity of the mystery guest. And the first caller who picks up on the clue and guesses correctly will win a CD, a signed autograph CD of Adam Sank live from the Stonewall Inn. You can see that as either a prize or a punishment, depending on uh, on how you feel about my stand up comedy. Oh, thank you. Clearly, the masses are excited and also a prize to the very first phone caller to the Adam Sank Show, because this is historic, whoever this phone caller is, and I believe someone is on the line. Is that right, Jeff? Yes, Adam, we have Karen on the line. Hello? Karen, you say what? What? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. You're our first caller thought... ever, Karen. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you knew somebody was listening, and also to know <laughs> that it's not going over the podcast. I have to go through the app. What, what, what? Go through what? The web... It's not going over the podcast. I have to go through the... Um, website. Katie, explain listen. that. Uh, what the no, fuck's happening? No, that would be something I explain. All right, explain uh, what's going on. It, it wasn't in the first two minutes of the 10-minute intro, but it should be starting up in the podcast app now. God damn it. Awesome. I just want you guys to know, so well, thank I'm you for... very excited, and congratulations. Thank you, Lovey. Where are you calling from? Boston. And uh, were you on the Love Cruise? Have I met you? No. But you're a fan I'm of Derek. I'm a single mom. I can't do that. Aw, you poor thing. I can't thing. afford it. How old's your How old's your kid? He's 16. Oh, nice. You still breastfeeding? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right, well. Ka- Karen. Thank you for uh, being my first caller. I really appreciate it. It is nice to know that at least one person is listening. Keep listening, and stay oh, on the line. Oh, there's li- a lot of people listening, Adam. Thank you. We'll stay on the They're line. Just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on the line. Jeff will take your info, and uh, and then uh, I'll send you a CD if you want one. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, honey. All right, I'm going to put you on hold, and Katie, the producer, will Speaking talk. of people listening, it didn't take long uh, after this show was announced on social media and on um, DerekandRomaine.com that a plethora of listeners discovered that Adam Sank Show, the letters of Adam Sank Show, also spell out Ass, A-S-S. And so if you are listening to the show, I would like to know that you're out there, and I would like you to tweet about the fact that you're listening to the very first Adam Sank show. Uh, uh, tag me, tag DNR, uh, DNR show, and um, hashtag ass. Hashtag capital A, capital S, capital S. We need to spread that ass. Jeff, you know something about that. We need to spread that ass far and wide and let people know that this show is happening. Do we have any other calls on the line? Not at this time. All right, great. Karen is our only listener. She's on there. We're, we're just collecting Karen's That's phone number so she can get your CD. How exciting. Again, uh, our number is 844-TALK-DNR. You guys, there are a, a lot of things happening in the news today that I want to talk about. First of all, the, the news of the day is that April the giraffe has given birth. Uh, April has been a, an internet sensation. I don't know if any of you, um, or, or you, I should just say Karen, because you're the only one listening, uh, have been following <laughs> The, the travails of April. What happened was April's out in um, Harpersville, New York, in some sort of giraffe farm. And uh, her handlers announced that she was going to give birth sometime between mid-January and mid-February. And they put like a 24-hour camera on her. And you could watch April day and night to see this miraculous birth. Uh, of course, it's now fucking April. And uh, <laughs> and April, coincidentally, the name of the giraffe, still had not given birth. So people were getting pissed. Like people were staring at this pregnant giraffe all day, waiting for something to happen, and uh, and no one did. Now a giraffe's gestation period is typically fifteen months. Whoa! Um, I know, which is c- painful for for uh, for anyone who's who's carried a child, I guess. But um, but here's what happened: as she paced in her pen today, two hooves began to appear. <laughs> This is according to the New York Times. 
two hooves just popped out of her pussy. And uh, I don't have a pussy, but that just seems unbelievably painful. And disturbing. Yeah, and also, who knew that a, that a giraffe was born feet first? It seems to me that that's a, that's a, a biological mistake. I would think the, uh, the head, I mean, think about how long that fucking neck is. You want that to come out first, I would think, and then everything else would be easier. But no, the, the hooves popped out. Well, do we know, and, in fact, uh, that the hooves are supposed to pop out first, or, or was this a breech birth? I, I, the, the Times doesn't say so. I assume it was normal. Uh, after a few hours, it was hours of labor, the newly born giraffe was lying on the floor of the pen, glancing around, looking as confused and bewildered as any newborn. Uh, the calf tried to stand a few times but was unable. After an hour, it was on its feet. It walked in an hour, you guys. Um, and it was not immediately known whether the calf was male or female. You know, they always say that. And I can understand if it's like a fish or something tiny, but how do you fucking not know that something the size of a giraffe isn't male or female? I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because they're so small when they come out? They're not that small. That's the point. Well, I mean, their genitalia might be small when they come out. I mean, I bet you the baby giraffe's penis is as big as mine, if it were uh, <laughs> if it were male, or even if it were a female, Have actually. you ever seen an adult giraffe penis? I feel like I've never even seen one of those. I, I feel like I have. When I went to the Bronx Zoo last year, there were giraffes, and I, I feel like I saw something swinging. They're, but ha- They're hanging? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, they're like horses. Horses have dicks. Oh, I've seen horse dicks. You certainly have, Joe. More than seen it. Uh, anyway, congrats. Oh, thank you. So congratulations to uh, April. By the way, April's father is named Oliver. Uh, not father. The baby The baby daddy is named Oliver. And he's not expected to uh, hang around because according to the park experts, bulls, as they're called. A the male, babies? Uh, no, a male, male a male giraffe is a bull. Really only care about two things, fighting and fucking. It actually Shade. says that in the New York Times. <laughs> Yes. I don't know that that was cause for the shade bell, but thank you for the for the continuing sound effects. I did ask for them. Um, in other news, in, in a place called East Palestine, Ohio, which sounds like it would be a place with a lot of meth addicts, um, a, an eight year old, <laughs> an eight year old took his father's van for a ride because he was craving McDonald's wow. and both his parents were asleep or passed out on Meth. meth. Who knows? Oh, meth doesn't really make you pass out. Anyway, um, this was uh, according to WJW in Cleveland. The father went to bed on Sunday, and then the mother fell asleep on the couch with the kids. Remember when your mom used to fall asleep with you on the couch? I don't. Anyway, uh, witnesses saw the boy driving, and, and and by the way, in the car with him was also his four-year-old sister. Wow. <laughs> they really wanted some nuggets. They wanted their McDonald's. Um, so the boy drove about a mile to the restaurant. Through intersections and over railroad tracks without mishap, witnesses say the boy appeared to be obeying traffic laws, which is good. And uh, when asked how he learned to drive, this is an eight-year-old boy, remember, he said he learned to drive by watching YouTube. So never say that YouTube isn't useful. Um, I'm actually kind of impressed with him that he did this. And I I feel like he should get like a special license and that also his parents should be um, sent away and (laughs) should relinquish custody. Maybe he knows how to drive that well, though, because he often has to drive the parents home drunk. It could be. It I'm could be that he's the, uh, the the designated driver. Jeff. Yeah. Well, and he packed up the sibling. That's nice of him. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's it, like, all right, we're all going. <laughs> McDonald's for everyone. Imagine you wake up and both your kids are gone and your car is gone. Wow. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> scary. And your kids are young, like eight and four. So that was a, a heartwarming story. And then in Folsom, California... Uh, there was a robbery from a Chick-fil-A franchise. It was not chicken. You would think that people would steal either chicken or money from a Chick-fil-A. They did not. What the thieves stole were three cow costumes. Oh, Jesus. Apparently, Chick-fil-A had... I, I, I hate Chick-fil-A. They're fucking... <laughs> Again, I don't know if that's a sad story. But... I think that's perfect. You go to Chick-fil-A and steal cow costumes? That's pretty low. <laughs> Well, apparently they use these cow costumes on their commercials um, because the cows want you to eat chicken instead of them, um, which is sort of ghoulish. And Chick-fil-A is a horrible company. They're the ones that are like devoutly Christian and they hate gays and you, you shouldn't eat there. Although I'm told that the chicken is delicious. Have you guys ever eaten Chick-fil-A? Yeah, I, I love Chick-fil-A. Once. I've been once. You I st- still go. Listen, if the gays had to protest every anti-gay thing, we wouldn't eat anywhere. We wouldn't go anywhere. We'd sit in our homes and in, in the corner with our thumbs in our mouths. You're a horrible be, person. There'd be nothing left to do. I just think it's really not that good anyways. Like, it's it's 
completely average. I mean, it's I'm fine. I'm a vegetarian. You are. So yeah, I Since have been for, for like the last two years. So I wouldn't eat it. Um, period. And if but if I were gonna eat chicken, it wouldn't be at some fucking piece of shit Chick Fil A anti gay bullshit. And Jeff, you're cut off. Um, anyway, uh, Chick Fil A says we're hoping that through us reaching out in numerous ways, the people who took the cow the cows as if they're actual cows, will come back to their senses and bring the cows back to us. We're hoping it's a prank. Uh, some commenters on Facebook called the theft beef napping. Uh, <laughs> and Police Sergeant Andrew Bates says, quote, it's not like somebody can dress up for Halloween in that. Why can't they? I, I think, well, because it's so well known of a costume that you would automatically know they were the two people that stole it from Chick-fil-A. I would be like, I didn't steal this. I made my own Chick-fil-A cow costume. I guess. Caller, you say what? Jason. Hey, Adam. It's Jason. How are you? Hey, Jason. I'm good. Where are you calling from? From New York. We met on the Love Cruise. Oh, my God. Shut the fuck up. Did we have sex? Yeah. No, no he's married. I... <laughs> no. That hasn't stopped me before. <laughs> Jason, how's my show going so far? Are you loving it? It's going good. Just want to let you know we are listening. There are about 30-something people in the chat room alone. Is anyone We're naked listening. in the chat room? I can't see. Uh, someone said something about boobs flashing already, so... Boobs or pets? That was Derek. It was Derek's Derek boobs. Flashes boobs. Are Derek and Romaine doing their own <laughs> sort of running commentary of my show in the chat room? Is that what's happening? They're not doing running commentary, yeah. but they are They are listening, and, and they're getting feedback from the listeners, which all has been very positive so far. Good. I have to... And now, and now Romaine has um, purple... Booze on her hand, and little Romy's behind her. Purple there boobs or booze? Ooze, ooze. Oh, I see. She, she had like spoke. putty, like you know that <laughs> guppy putty that makes the weird noises when you squirt it the right way or whatever. Oh yeah, they called that um, slime. Yeah. When I was little, it okay. came in a little. So Jason, uh, are, are you in? The, you're in the chat room as well. Yes. I'm not monitoring the chat room. I'm not on the internet. I'm not doing any of that shit because it's just me. I don't have like a partner like Derek and Romaine have, so I have to sort of stay focused. They're all bitching about Multicast, it, though. They want to see you on camera. They want to see me? Yeah, I mean, you can turn the computer know. around and show okay, me if you some, want. I'm, I'm, point, but I'm not going to like take my pants off this time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's me. Can you see me? I can't see myself. I can oh, here see I am. You. I'm up there in the corner. Hey, bitches. Thanks for listening. Tweet about it. Remember to tweet, tweet about the show. Hashtag ass. Adam Sank Show. Jason, what would you like to? Right. What would you like this show to be about? What would you like me to include uh, on this and future shows, if there are any? I don't know. Pop culture stuff, some political stuff, if you're so inclined. But I am inclined. I think you're doing a great job so far. So just keep keep it up. Keep Thank you, baby. You know. I appreciate your calling. Thanks for listening. If anyone else wants to call in, it's eight four four Talk Hi. DNR. Bye, Jason. Bye, Jason. Eight four four Talk DNR. Again, you are listening to the Adam Sank Show on the Derek and Romaine Radio Network. If you are listening to this for free. It's a live preview that Derek and Romaine have gifted you. And uh, you can subscribe and have access to this all the time. Not to me necessarily, but to Derek and Romaine themselves. And that's certainly better. Um, I want to talk about the story of the week, which is the United Airlines debacle with the passenger being dragged off. First, I want to just give you guys the latest. This is according to Reuters a few hours ago. United Airlines said on Friday that it is changing its policy on booking its own flight crews onto the planes. It, uh, it, from now on, if their flight, their own flight members need seats, uh, then they will make sure that they are booked into those seats at least 60 minutes before departure so that no one will be ejected from the plane. Meanwhile, they say that David Dow, the passenger who was dragged off, suffered a significant concussion, broken nose, and lost two front teeth. Wow. And will need reconstructive surgery. This is according to his attorney. And uh, the, attorney, the attorney also says he will probably sue the airline. Duh. Um, everyone's asking for the CEO, uh, Oscar Munoz, to resign. He says no. And uh, in, a, in a related story on a separate United flight... On Saturday, excuse me, on uh, on last Sunday, this was a scorpion, a live scorpion dropped from the overhead compartment onto a passenger and stung him. Hmm. Can you imagine you're on a plane and a motherfucking live scorpion suddenly lands on your head or wherever it landed and stings you? That is some motherfucking James Bond shit right there. Snakes on a plane, but with scorpions. That's bad. Um, anyway, the a physician says that it was not a life-threatening matter, but man, they're having a bad week. So here is my here is my very controversial statement about the United Airlines debacle, and I do want you guys to call in because I know everyone's going to be all furious and saying I'm a fucking asshole, 
and uh, and and disagreeing with me, but but just hear me out. First, my disclaimer: I think United Airlines handled this entire situation horribly. I don't think that people. I don't think flights should be oversold. I certainly don't think people should be bumped because they have to accommodate their own crew members who they didn't plan for. Um, I, nobody should be, you know, violently uh, apprehended and dragged off a flight. I do think he should sue, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, I feel the same way everyone else does. Okay. That said, I think David Dow is a fucking asshole. I think he's unstable. And I think that had he simply done what the crew asked him to do, then none of this would have happened. Let's first take a listen to David Dow after they asked him to leave his seat and told him that they and basically had the the police board the plane because he refused. Now, coincidentally, that was also the sound of ADD Jeff at the Eagle last night when he was bent over a pool table. Wow. Being sodomized by a pool cue. But anyway, that was not the sound of him being dragged, you understand. That was the sound before they dragged him, before any physical altercation had occurred. Wait, how do you know that? Because if you see the video of him being dragged, he's not screaming. He's completely, like, limp, basically. It was beforehand that he started freaking out like that. And then afterwards, after they dragged him off, he was running through the aisle going, I got to get home. I got to get home. I got to get home. Then we learn that this guy has been uh, criminally prosecuted for writing illegal prescriptions, for trading uh, prescription drugs for sex, and has been so thoroughly sanctioned as a doctor that he can now only practice one day a week at an out clinic. Now, I mentioned this on Facebook and I was so thoroughly attacked, so thoroughly savaged by everyone who's ever known me. You should be. I was called a racist. I was told that bottom. I that I was called a bottom. <laughs> that I don't take as an insult. Uh, I was told that I support police brutality. It was so ugly that I deleted my post, and I never oh, delete anything. Wow. I literally couldn't take the pressure anymore. But here is my feeling, you guys: <clears throat> an, an airport and an airplane since 9-11 is a very special place. It is not like any other environment. We do, uh, Jeff, shut the fuck up. Wait till I'm done. We do, all, we subject ourselves and allow ourselves to be subjected to all kinds of shit when we get into an airport or a plane that we would never normally allow. We allow our, ourselves, we allow our bags to be searched and x-rayed. We allow ourselves to be x-rayed and patted down. We stand there like sheep on these endless lines. We get on these flights and we do whatever the fuck they tell us to do, whether or not we agree with it. Even if we think that it's there's an unreasonable request or they're keeping us on the ground too long or they're making an unnecessary stop, whatever it is, whatever shit the airlines pull on us, we simply nod our heads and say, OK, because when you create a disruption in an airport or a plane, it freaks people the fuck out. It freaks out the other passengers and it freaks out the flight crew. And if you are a flight attendant, and I have many friends who are, you do not want to be in a situation with someone like David Dow. I'm not saying the airline was right to bump him. This is not about defending the airline. But if I were David Dow, and people who know me know this, I, I would have been furious. I don't take shit from anyone. I am the I'm the person that sits down and writes like endless letters <laughs> when I've re received shitty service or been mistreated in some way. I get refunds. I get apologies. Like I'm that guy. He had any number of remedies available to him once he got off that plane. He could have sued. He could have held a press conference. He could have demanded to see a manager and, and be put on a competing airlines flight that that the that United paid for. There were all kinds of things he could have done. Refusing a crew member's order is not an appropriate choice. It doesn't matter what the crew member is. Unless the crew member is asking you to strip or murder the person next to you, you do whatever the fuck they tell you to do, and you deal with the problem after you're off the plane. You do not create a disruption. And people say his background doesn't matter. Yes, it does. No, his it background doesn't. informs me, at least, that, that you're dealing with somebody who's a shady fucking character and who doesn't play by the rules. Now, I will now take <laughs> rebuttals and angry phone calls. Jeff, start with you, because you seem Listen, to be chomping at the bit. 
you just gave an excuse as to why airlines are allowed to give shitty customer service or why everything that comes out of a flight attendant's mouth is supposed to be a verbal command as opposed to a request or some customer service oriented way of dealing with a situation. Demanding me to get off the plane, I wouldn't have screamed and yelled like some guy being murdered and stabbed 400 times. But I would have been quite loud, and I would have made them drag me, for sure. You wouldn't have done this? I wouldn't have done that. I saved that for the bedroom. Katie, do you want to weigh in before we take calls? You have plenty um, of time to weigh in. We had to make the phones ring. Okay, I just feel like it's really on the the company to not let it get there. Like, I, Exactly. I know there were you know policies but they should have just kept offering more money then people are like oh well it doesn't matter how much money someone might not have taken it someone will would have taken it at some amount of money there's going to be some equilibrium of value versus getting off a plane and you would have sidestepped this whole See, I agree with that I'm not arguing with that I think United again there's no defense of what United did. No one should have been bumped, especially after you know people refused to give up their seats. It was completely unfair what they did to him. And the flight attendants could have fl- uh, rented a car and drove there. It's come out it's like five hours away. They weren't flying till the next day. But they can't be up for that long and then fly a flight. I have many flight attendant friends too, but I think 9-11 is a big excuse for anybody who works in an airport now to take things to the extreme and be assholes. Sometimes do... they don't even have to be assholes. They just do it because they can. Yeah, and they take we're liberty this, because yeah. we can't we can't cause a scene and we can't do anything back that they have more power. Than exactly. And that sucks. And I hate flying because of it. And I agree with all of that. And and I think it's great that United is, is changing its policies. Every airline should change its policies. They have taken advantage. I agree with you. That said, as long as this is the environment that we are in. What is this when, environment? The one in which you do not create a disruption in an airplane or an airport. Period. Oh, God. You don't create one unless your your life is being threatened. No one was saying, you know, no one was holding a gun to his head. They were just saying, get off the plane. Give up your seat. It wasn't that big a fucking deal. It was a major uh, it inconvenience. It would be to me. Like, if I have to travel for work and I'm not going to get where I need to go on time. Oh, he's not going to get home for his one day of the week for his outpatient that clinics. That doesn't matter. So he, he has somewhere to be. Give he them bought drugs a ticket. in return for sex. He bought a ticket. He could have drugs stuck up his I just, ass. It still doesn't matter. I just, I, I'm, again, I'm not someone who, who takes shit from anyone. I would never in a million years but do But you what never he get did. where you're going either, then, do you? I don't. Exactly. I'm, I'm frequently grounded. Uh, are there any calls? No, we're making an outgoing call. Good. Oh, we are making an outgoing call so we can get our first guest on the line. Listen, uh, it's, uh, people keep bringing this argument back to what the airline did. I cannot defend anything the airline did. I'm simply saying. To those of you who are flying, and this isn't just on an airplane, by the way. This is when you don't get your coffee right, when you don't. Uh, no, that's different. When they don't, when they run out of the tickle me Elmo doll at Christmas. That's different. People are losing their shit all the time. We see this on YouTube, where a customer in in lots of different situations just flips out, and they think it's acceptable to act like a giant baby. It is not. We have to act like adults. We all have to act like adults. Ugh, whatever. The end. We'll talk and that goes later. for David Dow. Um, I will ask our next guest about this. But first, I need to tell you um, who this beautiful man is. First of all, his name starts with a G, and it is a hard G. And it's important that you know that. You know him from CSI, where he played Bobby Dawson for years. You know him from Bear City and Bear City 2, from the fabulous movie Daddy, and his brand new documentary, which he directed which can be seen on allmailallnude.com starting today. It's called All Male, All Nude. Please welcome the sexy, the beautiful, the talented, Gerald McCulloch. What are you doing, Adam? <laughs> uh, what the fuck am I doing? What, what, I like that applause, though. That was fucking awesome. We have a studio <laughs> audience here applauding you. Nice. That's so sweet. That's Ger- for the phone. Gerald, where, where are you? I'm in the city of Atlanta right now, looking at a beautiful skyline. Um, and tomorrow, being Easter, I just found out that tomorrow I'm going to, they have, in the parking lot of a bar, they have drag races. So I'm very excited to spend Easter in Atlanta. <laughs> now, when you say drag races, you don't mean drag queens running I up a hill. Mean, I do mean, I do mean exactly that. <laughs> I cannot wait. In the daylight. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. 
know. <laughs> Gerald, let's set the record straight about your name because it's spelled Gerald. Everyone calls you Gerald. You I hate know, it. No, but you're awesome. I fucking love that I got to be introduced with someone who's saying my name right. Even your yes, your Gerald. production company is called Hard G Productions, correct? It certainly is. Yes, it is. Now, <laughs> no, I'm sticking with that shit. Why not just change your name to Gerald? It seems to me that if everyone gets because it wrong. Them, I don't know. They don't know more, though. I've talked. I've showed them the way of the hard G. Um, it's my mom's middle name, and it was her dad's name before that. So it's always been Gerald, never Gerald. And I'm not going to change my name because people don't know how to say it right. I figured I'll just I'll just be in for the long run and make sure they know how to say it by the by the time I get to meet them Fair face enough. to face. Now, Gerald, yes. I literally ran into you on the street the other day. I know. Isn't that the great thing about New York City? And that, I, I love that city like nothing else. You were face down. Yeah, and, and you look great. You, you thank you. Very, you look very handsome. You were face down in an alley. And, uh, I know, well, I was very busy. I'm, you know, when I'm in New York, i got to get a lot done real quickly. <laughs> no, it was great. to Actually, it was one of those things where I saw you and I just thought, Oh, that's a sexy guy. And I kind of looked back and did a little, you know, wink, wink and wiggled my ass a little. And then I thought, oh, shit, I know him. That's Gerald McCulloch. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right when you're wiggling your ass, because I noticed that you're wiggling and it stopped really abruptly. Yes, I was, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was very embarrassed. Um, but you started telling me as we were walking, we were both going to the theater. You, I was going to see Present Laughter and you were going to see your boyfriend show. Yes, I went to go see the opening night of War Paint, which was incredible. Can you believe it? His boyfriend's the director of War Paint. Nice. What's it? Tell, now, tell us his name. Come on again. now. Come on. Keep it on the down low. Keep it on the down low. Is that a secret? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we break news here on the Adam Sank Show. Sorry about that, Gerald. Um, That's right. Anyway. I don't know where Gerald was going, and I don't know who his boyfriend is, but we were we were talking, and he was telling me that he has just completed his very first documentary, and it's about male I strippers. Have. It is about male strippers. And I was um, instantly yeah. fascinated. Tell us about this I documentary. Know, it, it is kind of fascinating, isn't it? Well, um, around, I guess, like my third or fourth season of CSI, I finally stepped out on a limb and, you know, kind of followed my dream, which was to become a filmmaker. So I started, I made my first short film around my third or fourth season and called a moment after it did really well. It played at the Atlanta film festival, which is a rather prestigious film festival. So it was nice to come back home as a filmmaker. Um, cause I finished up high school and college, uh, here in Atlanta. So I have roots here. So it's nice to be back in the city where I have roots. Yeah. Anyway, so my short film played here, and that night, a bunch of my high school gal pals and I and my sister um, went out to Swingin' Richards, I've been which there. is an all male. I know I, I had not been here there, so it's an all male, all nude gay strip club located in the heart of the Bible Belt. And I walked in there, and I was like, "Oh my God, <laughs> there's a story here somewhere." So um, I started shooting content and. Became really close friends with a few of the dancers and uh, just kind of fell into learning about their life and their job and why they chose to do that job and what the job was. And um, I think like a lot of people was instantly enamored and fascinated by the whole world. And as I was working on this project, mm -hmm. the first Bear City came my way. And I actually turned down Bear City because I wanted to see this project through. And uh, I'm very glad that Doug Langley, the director, talked me out of turning it down, and then between Bear City and then just after I finished shooting the first Bear City, I was cast in the play, the off-Broadway play of Daddy, so I went straight from filming Bear City into Daddy, and then those two stories kind of took my life on a six-year journey, and now I'm finally getting to go back to this documentary that I started five years ago. That was a long awesome career, by the answer. way. Nice, nice career well, there, Gerald. I, I would <laughs> kill to have well, any one of those projects. Now, when you say that you were shooting... When you say you were shooting um, content at Swinging Richards, you were shooting cock. There's a lot of cock shooting, in this was, movie. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of isn't there a lot of cock in this movie? Oh my no, god! I figured you know they said that there's so much dick in this movie. I said I said this to one person before, but I've been editing for about four or five months. You know, this has been a kind of a pet project of mine, as I said, for about five years. <laughs> and in project. the last four or five months, I finally, I know exactly. I finally <laughs> that's that's Jeff laughing, by the way. I know. I know. <laughs> well, it's true. There's so much dick in this movie. Um, and so I've been editing, and I was like, during the editing process, I realized, wow, <laughs> like I filmed a lot of dick. 
<laughs> now, as you're editing, are you like do you have to stop and jerk off as you're as you're editing? <laughs> no, no. no the I got, first I night got I went there, I spent over eight hundred dollars. It was bad. <laughs> and it's crazy, isn't it? That place is crazy. Now, but I feel like it's a fun journey getting to know the lives of the guys behind the strippers. Now, my and favorite I guy, because because I watched a uh, a screener of this that Gerald was kind enough to send. It really you can't take your eyes off it. I mean, there's these young, beautiful men with just perfect penises, like just some of the nicest penises ever. Um, and the and what about the balls? Great I balls. Some balls. Oh my god. <laughs> and uh, my favorite is the guy who fought in Iraq, and is now. Um, like getting a double degree in like biology and yeah. he's got this incredible Here's... body but he wears glasses and looks kind of like a, a like a hot nerd he's like a hot nerd with a beautiful penis who fought in Iraq and like I just I came spontaneously I just as soon as I heard that <laughs> there was a puddle on my sofa oh really well and from what I hear it was a very very big puddle <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. For, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm here all week. Fish. <laughs> but but tell us about some of the guys you met, and 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 I'm also interested to know, like, they all seem straight. Are there any that are gay? There are. There are quite a few that are gay. You know, there's about there's consistently about sixty to seventy five dancers employed there, and um, you know, I touch on a, the sexuality of a few of my guys. <laughs> But they also kind of like to keep it rather open, uh, understandably so. Um, and so a lot of the guys that are forthcoming about their sexuality, um, yes, the guys that I captured in the film, the ones that fess up to whether they're a parent of a child or whether they're supporting their family, children and wife by doing this job, um, there's a few of them, yeah, that do articulate their sexuality. But there's a lot of guys that don't. And I want to respect that amount of that. Um, well, a lot and, of the straight, yeah, uh, unlike me, who did not respect your privacy in, in announcing your boyfriend to the world, uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of the guys, several guys in the film, mention that they are married to strippers, female strippers. Yeah, there's a few of them are. I mean, you know, I, I, I focus on about six or seven of the guys, but again, that's just a small percentage of. You know this crazy, unique family that's formed with all these guys that are strippers here, and yeah, a portion of them are straight. Um, but still, they, even that, I was really, really, really uh, interested in watching how they have these very respectful relationships with so many of their regular customers. You know, which are which are gay men, right. and it's such a really respectful, cool, symbiotic relationship between these very handsome sexy, straight guys relying on these, you know, gay men of different races and ages to support them and their families and their lifestyles. And there's such a, it's such a beautiful friendship to, to witness. Yeah. And that was one thing I really fell in love with in the process of gaining content for this is getting to know some of the regular customers and getting to see how, you know, truthfully honest and good these entertainers are to their clients. It, sure, it was, I mean it was very I, sexy and very cool. I myself have never gotten into the whole uh, stripper go go boy thing because I'm a cheap Jew and I just hate to give money away. <laughs> um, and a bottom. It's the best dollar you can spend. It's the best dollar you can spend, though. Hold on, Katie. Tell tell, tell Gerald tell Gerald what I am, Katie. Oh, it's loading up. Hey, bottom. Thank Katie. you. Do it. <laughs> he keeps Bottom. missing. Okay, so, uh, but but yeah, so I don't get into the whole transactional stuff, but I know there are so many guys who are really turned on. I got into it, uh, and well, you're into everything, Jeff. Uh, who are, who are just so so Go, so satisfied by having these these godlike men, these Adonises, just like jangling in front of them and just giving them endless oh, amounts of money. It. There's a real thrill there to be had for these guys. And I think particularly if you're, you know, and I'm, I don't want to stereotype um, strip club patrons, but I think if you're someone who's a little bit isolated and may not necessarily have the most exciting wildlife, you can go to a place like Swing and Richards you're and you dick. can and you can have. Well, I'm just saying, I think it's it for for some people, it's probably the most exciting part of their week. Hey, I get out a lot and I went to the VIP room three or four times. I was paying these guys to oh suck their God, dicks. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Now, there are there, there are these VIP rooms and I've seen these in other clubs. There's there's one down in um, Key West. What's the name of that club where they drop the the 
the I slipper no on New Year's Eve. Anyway, someone, one of the listeners will know. Anyway. Um, they had a back room as well where you could like go for a quote unquote VIP dance or a private dance. And I've always assumed, because I've never done it, because again, I won't pay anyone for anything, <laughs> um, that there's like something going on back there other oh, yeah. than dancing. What what's uh, is that not discussed? Did anyone talk about that to you? What were you able to uncover, Gerald? It is discussed, and I'm very vague about that in the movie, um, <laughs> out of respect for these guys that are now my friends. Um, but I mean, uh, it's you know you can let your imagination wander as it um, is. Yes, and. Uh, that's all I'll say on that subject. Mine's not wandering. I know exactly <laughs> what happens in now, there. When, while you were filming this movie, Gerald, did you yourself get to fluff any of the dancers before they came out and did a set? Um, well, they 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 dance together, so there's no fluffing involved, and nor are there erections. So oh the yes, I noticed that. What would do would be pointless because the erections make it illegal. So as long as the guys are wearing one article of clothing, which is a Arm an armband. They can't wear it on their leg or be, socks. No, they can't because it's too close to their genitalia. So you can only tip them in the armband, and the band has to stay on the arm. And that is their piece of, a piece of clothing that they wear. And just um, so people understand, it's not a, like a Nazi armband. It's just like a, a one of those like hair rubber bands around exactly. the eyes to, yeah, <laughs> to hold the tips in place. Just the tips. Yeah, like a sweatband, you know, like. It, it's so interesting that they're not allowed to get hard. And one of the things I was thinking as I was watching these swinging penises uh, is that not only are these guys hu well hung, but they all have big dicks when they're flaccid. There's a lot of guys who have big dicks, but when they're soft, you can't tell. It's just like an, you know, I've been with this one guy. Uh, he, he, he's got like an inch and then it grows to nine inches, you know, and but he Which would is never, a beautiful growth spurt. Yeah, I mean, that, listen, I, if if I could, if my I'm, one inch dick could grow to nine inches, I I, I would uh, retire. But um, but you're happy with three. You're happy with three. I'm really not. <laughs> I'm not at all happy. That's my. Those are the people that want to have sex with me, right there, Katie. Just um, no, but but so you you have to be a shower in order to work at Swing and Richards. Yeah. You, well, not everyone's a shower. Certainly, the guys that I gravitated towards are showers but you know the beauty about that club which i you know think is amazing is that they're really in 70 guys there are a variety of ages and types and you know so and penis sizes now for the record are you yourself a grower or a shower gerald <laughs> i would say i'm kind of in the middle i i show a little bit and then it certainly grows Yes, sir. Did you like that answer? Was I that did was like the right it. answer? To the... We have uh, we have <laughs> just a, we have just a couple minutes left. I want to remind people listening that they can uh, they can download this documentary themselves at if all they mail. Can't it, they can stream it. Stream it. Stream excuse it. me. They can't download it. I don't. I I don't know what the kids are saying these days. I'm know. still. I know these kids are crazy, aren't they? I'm still living in the '90s. The name of the website is allmailallnude.com. And if you go there, you can watch the trailer for free or you can uh, stream the movie for a very small fee and you can see all of this gorgeous cock yourself. I just want to quickly talk about Daddy, which was uh, your directorial debut and is now available so, on yeah. iTunes and Amazon. Yeah, and, and then uh, here, TV is launching their new app and it's one of the films that they are really pushing to launch their app. So I think for the next week, you can watch it for free on the Here TV app. Um, and they have recut my trailer and shrunk it and changed the framing so it doesn't look the way the trailer should look. I hate look, when but, things get um, shrunk. I know, don't you? And publicly, it's embarrassing. It is. Um, <laughs> it's shrunk and, <laughs> shrunk and squared. But I'm glad people worse. will... Get will shrunk and squared. Those of uh, the listeners who have not yet seen Daddy, which is a fabulous movie, are now going to get to do so. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that film. And you get the DVD from Amazon, which has tons of DVD extras that I'm very proud of, including um, some music by Corey Tut. Corey Tut did the soundtrack for Daddy, and he also did the soundtrack for All Male, All Nude. And his music is great, and we've become very good friends throughout the years, and it's great to kind of partner with him yet again on another yes. project. Gerald McCulloch, yeah. thank you so much for talking to us on the premiere Welcome of the Adam to Sank the Show. Web waves. Thank you, and the we will be radio waves. We'll be streaming allmailallnude.com. We will be uh, watching Daddy, and we will also be watching you in Bear City Three, uh, which will be yeah. released in summer of uh, of this year. So thank you so much. Thank I you love too. you. I, I want to see you your, your, your grower slash shower. 
And um, I look forward to showing it to you. Oh, and Gerald, how can people <laughs> follow you on yeah. uh, online? Uh, because it's Gerald and not Gerald on Twitter. I'm it's a hard G. On Instagram, I'm Gerald McCulloch. Weird spelling. And on Facebook, I'm Gerald McCulloch. And whatever else that may be, that's who I am, Gerald McCulloch. <laughs> Thanks, baby. Good luck with all your projects. I love you. All right, you're awesome, man. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye. Bye. All right. So uh, one of the things I forgot to do was give you guys the clue to our mystery guest. So there's no time for anyone to call in and guess, but the clue would have been eyelashes. The clue to our mystery guest is eyelashes. And joining me on the phone now, we're not going to tell you who it is yet, is our mystery guest. Mystery guest, say hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Let's see if we can figure out who you are. Um, oh. Are you... Uh, <laughs> Are you male or female? Uh, a man, yeah. I mean, if you, if you could define a man is a man's a big word. I would say more clown related. You're a man clown. <laughs> yeah, a man clown, yeah. Are you a top or a bottom? Wow. Well, I'm a top, yeah. I, of my game and in a sexual situation. Have you ever won RuPaul's Drag Race? Yes, I did. And, and sadly, if you've seen this season, I should win again. Oh, it's some looks on it, isn't it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bianca Del Rio is joining the Adam Stank Show. Come on. How are you? How's it going? I am so excited that, uh, that you have joined my premiere show. And Bianca, I know that you uh, tour literally all over the world in some of the most incredible places. So what exotic locale are you calling us from today? <laughs> You're going to laugh at this, but I'm actually in a car, leaving Los Angeles, headed to Anaheim. Oh, That's my God. That's the exciting trip of the day. So you caught me on a good one. But no, I mean, I make jokes about Drag Race so much, but honestly, truly, without the television show, I wouldn't be able to get to do all this amazing shit. So it's, it's opened a lot, of, a lot of doors that I didn't imagine possible, you know? So, so it, it kudos to the show and the magic of everybody that gets to watch it. It's, it's insane. Girl, so you get to go to... Amsterdam and, and, and London and, wow. and Anaheim. <laughs> You're fucking so, so busy. I looked at your website, uh, which is thebiancario.com. The amount of gigs that you're doing, and and you were let's you know let's be honest, you were busy before Drag Race. You were a, 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 yes. a very successful working drag queen. But since the show, I mean, what are you on on stage like three hundred nights a year now? Well, it's been pretty great. Uh, what's happening with it now is, you know, with the first spell after winning the show, I, I did a lot of bars. Uh, I did a lot of rounds of the bars. And then from then I wanted to create my own show, which obviously gave me an opportunity to work in theaters, which is what I've always wanted to do. So after like 21 years of drag itself, you finally get this golden ticket to perform in, in, in a space that has proper lighting and has a sound system. And you know how that is. So you're like, yay, this is unreal. So that's what's been great about it. And now, you know, with each year, I've been able to get a little more selective with, you know, a tour so I can do 29 cities in a chunk, which is pretty amazing. And, and I like to do them back to back. So that's great. So we did 29 in the U.S. already. And then we, we started in Australia, actually, last year at this time. And then 29 in the U.S. And then I did 14 in the U.K. And now I'm finishing out my last 15 in the U.S. before I start a new one. So it, it's just been kind of unreal. I say yes to everything. You know, this is like a, a golden ticket. And, you know, it's like 21 years in the making. So I think if I would have been you know, 19 years old, I probably wouldn't have appreciated it as much. But when you're 22, you kind of go, thank God, you know, what a, what a great gig to get, you know? Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Uh, you know, I recently was put into drag for the first time. Um, and how'd that feel? Like really good drag by, by a professional artist. Um, oh. I, I didn't mind the drag, although I looked like an old Jewish woman well, from Boca Raton. I, uh, you look pretty. I want to well, kiss you. That never stopped me. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> I really, I didn't, out. I didn't think I looked so good. My name was uh, Shatanya Face. That's a good one. Yes, but, there's a lot of Shatanyas. Yes. But Bianca, getting that makeup off was such a it's fucking a ordeal that I have to wonder, like, don't, do you ever just say like, not today, Satan? Like, I'm not fucking putting uh, all yeah, this yeah. shit on my face. Well, no, sadly, but it gets to this point. I mean, if you've seen my face, I don't blend. It's just basically line, line, lash, lash. And the best thing though to get it off is I found is coconut oil and also you know if you run a loop there's coconut oil again so it all works really good it's a pretty <laughs> nice man your eye gets crusted shut either with mascara or cum you can just go ahead and use your coconut oil and it works the best i mean i but had it, cum on my face that night and it did not take yeah. the makeup off at all you oh, see geez. that's the problem you got you got to put the cum before you put the makeup and that actually gives you a better layer i don't even and know coconut whose oil was. really does work try no, it and but, it's cheap uh, but at this point, so, so I mean, you've been doing this for so long. How long does it take you to beat your face? 
How to get ready? Oh, well, I can get ready, like, in an hour, you know. But, I mean, if I'm doing, like, a photo shoot or something, well, now we're now with Facetune and, and filters. It, you know, I really don't have to do much. But with, uh, with getting ready, I like about an hour, you know, depending on where it is. Like, right now I'm going to Anaheim, so I'll have two hours because I have to set up everything in the new space. You know, your lights and your shifts and your stuff. And I don't like to rush it. And, um, and then I have a meet and greet at, like, 6 p.m. And then I, do, I have, like, an hour of a meet and greet. And then I do an hour in between the show just to kind of review all my bullshit and try to remember it. And then I do the show at 8 o'clock. So, you know, after working in nightlife for so many years, doing something so early in the evening is, like, amazing. So you're out of the theater by, by midnight, which is a dream. You know, where my nights usually began in New York or midnight or one o'clock in the morning. Right. But do you enjoy the meet and greet? Because I find that shit exhausting. I don't even like, you know, when people come up to me after a comedy show and they're like, I want to talk to you. You're so funny. Like, I just want to disappear. Well, come on. That happened to you twice. I rarely <laughs> happen. <laughs> I mean, it, in my but, dreams, uh, it happens all the time. But I'm sure. Uh, no, I think what the weird thing about it is, and I know this is going to sound so fucking sappy, but, but what's been interesting that I've learned through the process is that even if you are, having that shitty day. What's kind of amazing is that you've got 100 to 150 people that paid extra to want to meet you. Majority are just wanting to get a photo, but I usually do the, the meet and greet before the show, so they're not too drunk yet, and they're still kind of scared of me. So you don't get into the, oh, you know, my mother died, I need a picture, I need a video <laughs> kind of a moment. My mother died. Where, well, they love to tell you that. It's really, you know, like when, when you're not giving them the right amount of attention, somebody dies. And, you know, with me, I can't help but say, well, that person died just to get the fuck away from you. They probably didn't even have a disease. They just didn't want to deal with it tired ass. But in the moment, it's kind of nice because you do the meet and greet before, so they're still kind of scared of you, you know, physically and, and you know, my face alone. Uh, and you settle into it. So people kind of you know, get, and you also get to meet what's great, too, is that it's like your first 10 rows of the audience. So you find out who's there before the show starts. So even if the whole room hates you, you know those 10 people are on your side because you took the time to actually schmooze with them before. And it's kind of fun. Some, you know, some people are really great. And some people, as I said before, will bring up death, which is always great at a comedy show. But uh, it's, not, it's not bad. And you get kind of used to it. You know, I've met some really great people. Let me ask you and this. Some, be- I, some, some I avoid, yeah. We, you know, we just lost Don Rickles. And yes. for me, like you are the Don Rickles of, of our generation. Well, that's too nice. That's what, a but you are comment, though. But I love him. I mean, there's no one better as far as uh, as far as the the kind of insulting, you know, cunty stand up that you do. And you have that thing that Rickles has, where you insult people like horribly, and they love you for it. So, <laughs> well, I mean, was he a hero of yours? Pretty amazing. Well, he's one of my favorites. I mean, I always said that it was, you know, Joan and Don Rickles were two of my favorites always, you know, so that's a, that's a huge compliment. But in fairness, it's like it's also being comfortable with yourself. I mean, he was what he was. He was a little short, crotchety Jewish man, and which is the most hateful thing. And what's genius is, you know, it's no different than me, except that, you know, I'm not Jewish. But I think once you make fun of yourself, it does allow it to make fun of other people. And I think sometimes people, are, especially with drag queens in particular, they're not necessarily self-deprecating enough, and that's where it goes wrong. That's where it, it kind of twists for them. I mean, I know I'm a joke, and I'm laughing at the fact that I'm a fool, but also I'm laughing at the fact that you're paying to come see my tired ass. So with me, anything is a joke, you know, and, and nothing is off limits, I think, especially nowadays. So many people are too touchy. I you know, agree I, with you. Cu- cultural appropriation. Yes. I have people on Instagram. I, I took a picture with a turban, and some 12-year-old bitch is, like, telling me, but it's cultural appropriation. I'm like, it's a fucking turban, you twat. It wasn't like I was driving a cab saying it was double parked, but I worked at 7-Eleven. It wasn't anything racist. I was just wearing a fucking turban. <laughs> you know, and you're like, who is this cunt? Some 12-year-old girl in Arizona, cultural appropriation. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you, the food come with the bad, you know? You just go, whatever, girl. But that's the world we live in. Somebody's gotta say something. Yeah, I mean, I think people really make a sport of being insulted nowadays, and I always, you know, I try to, I get into these arguments with people on Facebook, because they'll say, oh, I didn't like this joke you made. You know, I made a joke about, um, you know how Time Warner Cable just changed its name to Spectrum? Yes. So I said, they, they ch- they're calling it Spectrum because all of their employees are on it. And... Uh, and most people thought it was funny, but then, of course, one friend of mine was like, I'm on the spectrum, and you're not allowed to make that joke. And I'm like, yes, I can. I'm not okay, attacking the, I'm not attacking no, you. Also, no, there's like, what I find fascinating, and this is the thing, is that, first of all, I never, I never try to, I mean, unless I'm drunk, I don't really comment back on any of that kind of stuff, because it's, a, it's an endless battle. I mean, you can never walk away from Facebook or Instagram going, I won, right. because it just keeps fucking going. 
my favorite thing to do is, you know, to just post whatever the fuck I post. They start with their bullshit, and then you just block them. And then they go to Twitter, and they go, oh, my God, I don't know what I said. It seems like you blocked me on Instagram. And I respond, oh, my God, did that happen? I'm sorry. And then I block them on Twitter. <laughs> so then it's just like, you either get it or you don't. And I don't have time to explain myself, you know? And if you uh, know... See, I can't no afford person, to block anyone. I don't have millions of followers like you do. I've got, I'll like, say, 10 followers. I don't have millions. I don't have millions. But the thing is, it's kind of fascinating because I go, you know, I personally, I hate the Kardashians. I think they're fucking big old pile of shit. Oh, so too. I don't follow them. I don't, you know, watch the show. And I also don't go to her Facebook page and say, I hate you because you fucked a black man and now you're famous. Yeah. I, you know, we know that's to be fact, but it's not necessarily my daily thing. So I just think if you don't like me, you cannot like me and move the fuck on with your life. That's it's right. very simple. You don't have to prove to me that I'm wrong. Just stop following Or me. that I care. Or that I truly care in my heart. You know, you start to go, I'm a 40-year-old man. I'm going to die. It's cool. And so are you, fucker. And it doesn't matter to me what you think. This faceless person that, you know, because 90% of the shit they type, they'll never say to your face. Bianca. So, we have just, just a couple minutes left. I just want to ask you sure. a, a burning question that I have. Oh, a burning question? Oh, God. <laughs> well, because I have, like, gon- I have anal gonorrhea. So, uh, <laughs> I actually oh, did get anal gonorrhea on a Derek and Romaine <laughs> no, cruise. But that's, I certainly did. <laughs> but that's a story it's for that another time. Romaine. It's <laughs> that Romaine. Yeah. yeah, Romaine rubbed her <laughs> pussy on it. So, um, oh, God, trust me. Bianca, here's my question. Almost every yeah. drag queen that I know is a top. Yeah. Yeah. What's that about? Bottom. No, I I'm, know, I'm a bottom, but they're tops. Well, no, I think, I, I guess, maybe it's just a, well, no, because a lot of the ones that I know are not, but a majority are, I think. I also maybe think it's just that you're comfortable with yourself, and this is what it is, but it, what's shocking is how freaky how many people are into that kind of bullshit. You know, like, I don't take the clown into the bedroom. That's not going to work for me. <laughs> right? That's not, that doesn't work. There's nothing sexier. But, you know, there comes that great job. Well, finally, you can join the circus and be under a big top. <laughs> but I don't. I don't get into it as far as role playing, but this has always been just kind of my life and drag is what I do. So I don't know if some queens are trying to prove a point about masculinity, um, you know, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the secret to it all is. You don't think there's a personality that, that has to do with like wanting to be in control and wanting to sort of, you know, wanting to have that power. I, Cause I think it's a very powerful thing to be a drag queen. And I think they like power. Yeah. But it's also pretty shitty, too. You don't sing. You walk around. You're not a real lady. You're wearing all that makeup. It's not that difficult. So it's like maybe, By the way, maybe I, just, it's just, I just saw yeah. a picture of you sticking a dick through a glory hole in a porno. Yes. That's, uh, you know what's funny? My friend uh, Mark McNamara uh, does men.com, and they, he uh, writes these brilliant scripts. And so I get involved with those great scenes that people enjoy in a, in a porn. And he had this one where he said, I want you to stand at the story hall. And I said, fine. So then they said, we'll superimpose a dick or whatever. I said, no big deal. Well, they do, and people assume it's mine. First of all, it's a pink dick with red hair. That is not attached <laughs> to a brown person in a wig. It's a nice you dick, though. Ass, people. <laughs> it's, uh, what's his name? Uh, the one who doesn't wear deodorant. Uh, porn star uh, uh, Keller. Keller. Kobe Keller. It, it's his penis. Does he uh, stink? He was in the film as well. Yeah. So I'm in those pivotal scenes that you kind of just fast forward through so that you could get to the fucking, but I'm the plot of the story. And it's and called I, what? It's, uh, what is the name of that one that I did? I don't remember. I, I know I'm like good Bianca, bad Bianca, uh, so I play both, but I'm not sure what the name of it is. I mean, I've done so many at this point, I can't keep track. Well, I'm sure people Google Bianca Del Rio porn, they'll find any number yeah. of things. I mean, like, it, and people thought it was real, and I thought if I really wanted to do porn, I wouldn't wear that fucking dress, you douchebag. Any eyelashes. <laughs> Bianca, I cannot thank you enough for being uh, one of my very first guests on the show. No, it is thank a you. huge treat. I've always loved you, even when, even when before you were famous. Well, girl, I ain't famous. I ain't famous yet. Bitch, but you are so famous. That, no, shut up. At least like, I'm getting to work, and that's a good thing. And you're getting to work. So I wish you all the success with the show. And thank anytime, you. give me a shout from either Glamorous, Anaheim, or Tucson, or Amsterdam. I'll gladly chat with you guys. Thank you so much. Go to thebiancadelrio.com for all of her upcoming dates. She is a busy bitch, and uh, we thank her again. And I want to thank ADD Jeff and Kate, Kate, Katie wow. in Orlando, and all three of you listeners for being here for the very first Adam Sank Show. Spread that ass. Tweet about it. Hashtag ass. Follow me on Twitter at Adam Sank. Go to adamsank.com. Download my album. Goodbye. I love you. Derek and Romaine presents Adam Sank. 
VNR 2.0.